that sounded great. You got that, hey, we're going to do some more of those type of songs. We're going to sing in a few minutes, Jehovah, Yes, Jehovah, and Jehovah Jireh. So you can jive a little bit then. How about that? But it's good to see you today. It is fall, isn't it? It is. It is. Here it comes. So we're glad that you're here. Thank you for all that people, so many people are involved in ministry around here. And I just, I'm going to call him out a little bit. Mike was mowing lawn again this week. He does a pretty yeah. good job out there, doesn't he? Yeah. That's right. yeah, I'm grateful. Who all mowed this summer? I know you mowed. You mowed. Oh, behind you. Did you wow. Mow? Woo! That was the week that the pattern was like no. this. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We did turn off the sprinklers, but it rained, so I don't know if we'll mow anymore, but yeah, that's for sure. Well, we're going to start Isaiah 55 and uh, have opening prayer, sing some songs, some announcements, and then we'll go in and we'll kick off uh, the shoebox. That's always a special ministry that we do. I don't know how many millions of shoeboxes have gone out. It's just phenomenal to be part of that. So there's Bo. He's still a happy camper. Yeah. Yeah. Has he been behaving himself? He got the thumbs up. See, every week we got to look at her. If it's like this, look okay, we got to talk. That's right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to be back up here. Thank you for letting me speak last week. That was a good time. I enjoyed it. And uh, we're going to open in a call to worship this morning, Isaiah 55, verses 10 to 12, if you'll join with me. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Turn it on. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Amen. If you bow your heads with me, we'll open prayer this morning. Lord, thank you for uh, that truth, that your word will not return to you empty. Thank you for that reminder that just as the rain comes and produces uh, life, your word gives life. And um, we're just thankful for that and thankful to be a part of that and be um, the recipients of your word, Lord. We ask that uh, you would bless this morning, this service. Um, we thank you for everyone who is here this morning. We pray for those who are not able to be here if it's travel or illness or whatever the case is. I pray you'd be with those um, who need you this morning. And um, Lord, I just ask that you'd speak through Pastor today as he brings a word uh, from your word and that uh, we'd be blessed by it. And um, we just thank you for this family, this church, and uh, the, as we're kind of going into a, a time of fall of cooler weather. Um, we, we just look forward to it, Lord, and in this busy season, give everything to you. And um, we ask that our worship this morning would be uh, a joyful noise to you, and uh, we invite you into this place as we worship. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. to get the right sermon out. Oh, hello. Everybody behaving? <laughs> sure, sure, over here. Um, we get to have our meeting this week at Ambrose Ridge, don't we? Yeah, we're, and we're doing something a little different. We do a Bible study twice a month at Ambrose Ridge, and uh, the ladies said it there, but we're going to do something a little different this week. We're having communion. They asked to have communion there. A lot of the ladies don't get out much, and so on Tuesday when we have our time, we're uh, 
going to have communion and study the word so it'll be something kind of fun and special so it's a nice time to be with them roller coaster today we'll finish off joseph and that sounded a little not that kind of finishing off joseph but we will so jennifer and i had a wonderful time this past weekend we took dad cole mom cole and the whole family to minnesota and uh, went to uh, a Golden Gophers football game. The backstory is Dad Cole got his master's there and worked hard, didn't have any extra money, lived a half a mile from the stadium and could never afford a ticket back in the day. And so we, we rented an RV, it didn't hit too many things, and had fun, went there and uh, went to a game and uh, enjoyed it and uh, came back and we were road warriors 1,100 miles later, 1,200. So Did they later. win? Michigan won. I wore Michigan gear. The dad Cole and Jennifer and others wore Minnesota. So did Caleb, he wore Michigan gear. Uh, but you know, it was fun. It was just a whole new experience because it, it's smaller, but they're just very kind people and they all joke and they kind of knew they were gonna get beat and they're friendly and it was just a little more friendly to do that. But I would tell different people that we were in Minnesota and just down the road is this, the Vikings, right? And Kirk Cousins, and Vikings played Kansas City. So what does everybody ask? Taylor Swift there. Have you seen Taylor Swift there? I'm going, no, we were at the other game. What's this the Taylor Swift going anywhere? She's like, and that's the big thing to watch, you know, what game she goes to and watch Kansas City and who she's laughing with and now his mom and, you know, whatever, and kind of Zoom. It is kind of funny in a sense, I, I don't know, uh, it brings a lot of publicity to the team anyway, but she was present there, but no, I did not see her. You're kind of wondering, where am I going with this? Well, there's a, the question of the media is, is she there? Is there a presence there? And now let's just take that and, and, and move a little bit as we look at Joseph, and I'm going to review it and talk about this next thing. I, I found it rather significant in the, in, in, all of the, the, uh, the men that we've talked about as the patriarchs, that it all mentions, and God was with him. Now you may just, you know, as a kid looking at that, that, okay, great, God was with them. No, God was with him. And as we've been talking about their lives and the chaos of the, family, from dysfunction to all goofy stuff that would take place, and God was with them. That's huge, and it's, and it's appropriate for us today as well as to be reminded that, and God is with us. We come on holiday season, O come a come Emmanuel, Emmanuel means God with us, to read. So, we're going to look at that as two more points to finish things off, but that's, that's the big, big emphasis today as we look at that and as Joseph is going to pass away. So let me review quickly for you where we've been. Now, I'm sorry, the insert, I, I printed it out at home, didn't bring it, and I must have kept the document open because I couldn't print it out here. So that's last week's. It's all there, but we're not going to do the detail in between. Number one, we talked about the providential sovereignty of God in Joseph's life. I mean, talk about all the goofy stuff that went on, yet it was God's divine sovereignty providentially moving it around. And then we also then looked at the betrayals and the setbacks. He had all kinds of betrayals, setbacks, hurts and pains, frustrations, right? And he kept faithfully doing that. Faithful stewardship, you know, no matter where he was, whether he was in a jail, he served, when he was taking care of father's life, he served, it was all preparatory for what God would have for Joseph to do, especially in his end run, uh, towards the end of his life. And then the temptations, this one was sexual, but we all have temptations, and he said, I will not sin against God, and he kept, it, and he, you know, nobody was there to catch him, right? His mom and dad and everybody was way back where, and he kept that straight. And then <clears throat> forgiveness, we looked at that at the end of uh, when his dad, Jacob, passed away and the brothers came to him and we spent a great deal of time. In that outline, it has those six points. We did that last week, we're not gonna go for it today. But 
At the end, he forgave them and said God had a purpose for all this to happen. So one of the kids that was here for the homeschool had this two or three weeks ago. God loves you, and I'm trying. <laughs> I think it's in Jason Gray. Is that a song or sing? You know, I thought, you know, how throw that in there with that whole aspect of forgiveness, because it's it's it, it is really pretty tough to forgive and to maintain it. And and there are people that it's much easier than others to forgive or to uh, not acknowledge uh, and, and remember what they did. So when we talk about dreams and, and God does. Amazing things. Doesn't seem to use dreams as much as he used to. You hear things out of dark areas and countries. He, does, he works. We listen to his voice. But God used that in Joseph's life. And here's his God's presence. So I'm going to read a lot of scripture today. Is that okay? Scripture is kind of important, isn't it? But let me read this passage or this uh, this story of Corey Tim Boom. It says, Cory Timboom was a little girl. Her father used to tuck her in bed at night and he talked. And you remember, she was a, a Dutch. She helped with uh, Jewish people and went to Auschwitz and survived them. Uh, her father used to tuck her into bed at night and he talked and prayed with her and then laid his big hand on her little face. Later, when Cory was imprisoned in the brutal concentration camp, she would ask God to tuck her in and lay his hand on her face. Isn't that something? It says, that would bring me peace and I would be able to sleep, as she wrote in the book. Now think about that. I mean, we have tough times. Probably few of us have been to concentration camps. And yet the peace in the midst of suffering and loss, death, and the remind that our Heavenly Father is present with us at every step of the way. So let's let's look at that, and I want to bring some things out, and, and just hopefully this, this point and the next one will be just an encouragement to your walk of faith and understanding. And so in, in chapter 39, uh, as we look at all the different things that go on in Joseph's life, uh, 39 and verse 2. And so Joseph, with Potiphar's wife, he's, in, you know, he's been in the, in slit, sold into slavery. Potiphar's bought him. Now in verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph and he became successful. Go to verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Now uh, you know the story, and then he got falsely accused, and now he's thrown in prison. So I looked at, at my notes and said, uh, and, sh and it said that, uh, and God was with him and showed him steadfast love. And then I said, really? Is that what Joseph thought? Think about it. Here we go again. Betrayed, falsely accused, sold into slavery, in prison for something I didn't do. And God's with me in his steadfast love. Really? Not that we've ever said that. And yet that's what the inspiration of the Spirit and the writer Moses says. And God showed him steadfast love. Why? Because he worked. He kept diligent. He trusted and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison, the keeper of the prison with Joseph in charge. God was with him, and, and he knew it somehow, some way. We'll look at that from a theological, we know that God is on the present, farthest star away, to right here, and how many hairs on your head, how many sparrow that falls, and yet somehow we distance ourselves from that. The God with us in the dwelling presence. We won't go through these passages, but it says the same thing of Ishmael. Uh, again, Ishmael, the challenge. But God was with him. And he and Hagar were kind of kicked out, remember? And because Isaac was supposed to rise to the scene. And so Ishmael and his mom Hagar were castaways. And, but it said God was with him. And Isaac, 
but to a couple different times. God was with him. Jacob, the schemer, the wrestler. Different passages that said God was with him. What a tremendous passage. I just I saw this throughout the scriptures in, in just these patriarchs' lives alone. We talked about you know, God was with them and leading them. And, and so let's turn to the Psalm 139. Let's make this look applicable to us today as we're reminded of uh, the Word of God. David's passage in 139, you may be familiar with it, but let's let's read it and be reaffirmed with it. One, 139 and 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you formed my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. You saw my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, my days, the days that were formed for me, then as yet there is none of them. Isn't that an incredible passage? And this is David. Sure, he had triumphs. He had a few lows too, didn't he? That's where the rubber meets the road. And it feels when there is quote unquote success or things going our way or it doesn't seem to have too many hiccups or pushbacks. God's, and how many times have you heard this phrase, God has blessed me? Well, it's not wrong. But then when it goes the other way, when it's a season of testing or a season of suffering, a season of uncertainty, is God not blessing? Think about that. Scary, isn't it? That kind of gets close to home. And how easily the enemy continues to wedge between our heart and our mind this aspect that we're still loved by God and that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans chapter 8, 31 to the end. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave himself up for us, how would he not also with him graciously give us all things? who shall bring any charge against God's elect. It is God who justifies. Who is, uh, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughter. I don't think we want to admit that, but I think maybe you have your moments, right? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present or things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yeah, and all God's people said, Amen. yeah. It's when, the, it's when we get into those difficulties that we challenge that and our faith needs to reaffirm that. Um, Emmanuel, God with us. The book of John talks about a meaning, uh, remaining and abiding. It's a decision that we make. Feelings can't be, feelings mess us up. Here's an interesting thought. You know, we just read David, where can I go from your presence? When David, had, in his repentance, uh, killing Uriah, the issue with Bathsheba, what did he say in, in Psalm 51? It says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. You know, 
And not that he would or not that we're not talking Arminian theology where we lose our faith and spirit, but he understood that even in the midst of, the, if the Holy Spirit was taken from him, he'd be on his own. And so for us to continue by faith to grapple with that. I listen to, uh, so I have church every morning. I listen to movie radio. There's a lot of different speakers, so I steal all my sermon ideas off of them. Well, not really, but I get a lot of ideas. So there, there was some, I don't know if you even remember who she is. It was a female. She was a mom. She was involved in music. I think her husband was too. But anyway, she had to step aside from music and was raising little kids. And then in the, in the midst of this, you know, she felt kind of disconnect. She was doing ministry before. Now she's just changing diapers and getting formula and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then, and then she was thinking this through, and the Lord brought to her attention and said, yeah, but this is still God's work. You're, you're serving in every aspect of your day. And she came upon with this quote that I want to, uh, uh, she, uh, I'll go back to this guy, this brother Andrew. She had this quote, invite the glorious into the mundane. Write that down. In your mind, Invite the glorious into the mundane. It's, it's kind of prayer without ceasing kind of concept. But invite God, God I'm, I'm here, I'm washing dishes. But, you know, or I'm doing laundry. Or I'm going to work. Or I'm mowing the lawn. Or whatever. And for her, it was, it was a renewal. And it, and, it, and it brought God's presence in her in it just gave her some assurance and encouragement, right? Whether you're in school, whether, and as I'm thinking about this, you know, invite God, the presence of God, into your marriage, if, if, if things are challenged, or into your family, or your, the dynamic, or into your job, the challenge of the neighborhoods, into your health needs, or going to the doctor again. Nobody goes to the doctor anymore, do they? <laughs> you know, or me, here we go again. Your daily routine. Your private times of worship, your heartache, your pain, your disappointment, your frustrations, your fears, your finances. When that is, evokes inside, but bring God. You, you, you're here. If you're a believer, you've got an indwelling in your presence. But Lord, I bring you into it. So I'm also going to share, you've heard me mention in years gone by, his brother Lawrence, who was a monk in the 17th century. I think he was over in the Spain area. And so he wrote a classic book called Practicing the Presence of God. Say that with me. Practicing the Presence of God. And he would often, as a monk, he was washing dishes. And, and if, it's a short little book, but it talked about him as he was praying and practicing. That it was kind of mundane. Here am I washing. I'm not like doing the big monk stuff and doing what they do or pray or whatever. But he's washing the dishes. How, how unimportant is that? And in it, he said, I, I practice God's presence. God's there. It's us that have to kind of get our, our reminder on, if you will, that he's walking with us. And we invite him in to the mundane. So Brother Lawrence is his name, but he has a couple great passages. So I'm going to go back. And, and yeah, let's read this together. These are two classics. The most holy... A necessary practice in our spiritual life is the presence of God. That means finding constant pleasure in his divine company, speaking humbly and lovingly with him in all seasons, at every moment, without limiting the conversation in any way. Isn't that kind of a profound thought? And he has another one. There are many. Together, the time of business does not differ with me from the time of prayer. And in the noise and the clatter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in as great tranquility as if I were on my knees. Isn't that an interesting thought? So invite the glorious into the mundane 
and be reminded and encouraged of God's presence with us. And uh, don't believe the enemy when he comes knocking at the door and says, oh, hey, by the way, you know, if there is, obviously, if there's something between the soul and the Savior, we've got to deal with it. But he still loves us. And that's something. I mean, we could be ticked. What's the thing with the marriages? You know, I still love her, but I don't like her right now. <laughs> because we got some issues going on. God loves us. He, he, steadfast love. We don't even, we can't grapple that because we're, we're so fickle. Uh, and it just never ceases, and it's never more or less. The next thing, the last thing that we'll look at today is future perspective. I brought this, because um, Joseph, excuse me, Joseph had a, a, a future perspective that helped him. And I think we can glean from it, because we're going to go to Hebrews as well. But I just want to remind you, because... I don't know about you, but I've been kind of glued to the news this week about Israel and Hamas and all of that. Isn't that something else? And, you know, Lord, okay, are, are you getting ready? Are you, are you coming quickly? Um, oh, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, so in that, I first want to remind ourselves is that it, it's all the patriarch's heart, fault. Because uh, the issues that have been going on it are, have been right here. This is Abraham and Ishmael, right? Hagar. And these are all the people that came as a result of Ishmael's lineage. And then Keturah, who is who was Abraham's wife after uh, Sarah died. And, and they had all these kids. And these people, and this is kind of the Arab group that go way back. So they've been fighting for thousands of years. And in fact, one of the, if you look at Genesis 16, it says of Ishmael, he will be a wild donkey and his hand will be against everybody. Well, you look at the history of that area, there's been conflict from the beginning, right? And I'm not necessarily trying to choose sides. We know what the scripture says about Israel and we pray that Israel would awaken in their spiritual awakening. I don't know about you, but you know, I got thought thinking, wow. Is it going to be an Antichrist coming? If this, going to be, if this thing is going to explode, you know, maybe somebody will come to the surface and, you know, we don't like the idea of Antichrist, but it's getting the ball rolling, right? That would be exciting. So, but Joseph, <coughs> was it 1840-something B.C., a little before my time? <laughs> well, you woke up on that one, didn't you? He is, he's going to pass away. Go with me to Genesis chapter 50. Now, he's forgiven his brothers. He's 50 more years of life. We don't have any other story other than he had 50 years of life after his, you know, there. And now he's going to die. So in, in Genesis chapter, last chapter 50, verse 22. Uh, so Joseph remained in Egypt. He and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children of uh, also Makar, and the sons of Manasseh were counted as Joseph's own. So Joseph had two kids, right? And then what, when you get the 12 tribes, Israel, the Levite tribes didn't get possession of the land. They were to be involved in work, so they didn't get uh, land. So the two tribes, Joseph would have then that the field by Esau and Manasseh. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the end that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. But this is a long time after Abraham. Joseph died in a foreign land with people, that his family that God brought together after this roller coaster ride. And then Joseph May the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. Now, I've read this many times, but it just didn't grab me. Maybe it was now, too, with the idea of, you know, mom and dad are not with us. You, you think about that a little bit more. But he was concerned about not just his bones, but it speaks volumes of the future. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him. He was put in a coffin in Egypt. But you know what? He didn't stay there. 
switch the next page to Exodus. So the clock gets started. It says in Genesis that there would be, in to Abraham, Genesis 15, there's going to be 400 years that my people will be in slavery in a foreign land. So when Joseph dies, that clock is starting to tick. So maybe around 1846 BC, to Moses is going to come on the scene, and the law given in 1446, the Exodus. There's about 400 years, give or take, in there. So in Exodus chapter 1, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came out of Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt, and then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now, there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And of course, we get into the slavery part, and then God's raising up um, Moses, and that's about the 400 years. So, but this is the exciting part. In Exodus, when they leave, <coughs> turn to Exodus chapter 13 and 19. 13, 19. And Moses took the bones of Joseph. You got a lot of years between there, right? With him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved them to Succoth and encamped there. So he's moving these, now go over to Hebrews chapter 11. This great chapter of faith. Hebrews chapter 11. You're going to get a workout the scriptures today. I often have it so you can read them, but the passages are rather large. It would have uh, made it a little bit more difficult. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 22. And the scripture says, By faith Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of Israelites, and gave him directions concerning his bones. Uh, what's the big deal? He had a future perspective. He wasn't going to stick around in Egypt. God's plan, 400 years later, again, America's like 250 plus years old. That's a long time to forget. And yet in the sovereign plan of God, he's going to bring them out. Joseph knew that, he, you know, that's how he could forgive. He said, God, I went before you. God had a year to protect you. So they got 70-some people in Egypt. They're going to end up with maybe two and a half million people at the Exodus coming out, and they're going to the promised land. Isn't that something? And he knew this. So this whole thing he gave, he left instruction concerning his body. His body you know, that's that future perspective. That was his faith, Hebrews talks about. And I'm just thinking about us. You, your life, yeah, if you haven't made, I mean, practically speaking, if you haven't made arrangements for the time that God would call you home, it's probably wise for your family because it's a lot of work if you don't. But it's bigger than that. It's what God's going to do beyond us, right? And he gave instruction to them. He, you know, they gave, he embedded in them not just a legacy of faith, but saying, God isn't finished, he's got future plans, and I'm going to make sure I'm there. And, and it goes on to say that in Joshua, he was, they buried him, and, they, and, and even symbolically and reality that Joseph went with them out of the exodus in triumph and brought them through for 40 years of wandering and into the promised land. He was kind of with them, the bone. Think about that. And that, was his, and that was his instruction. So he had this perspective of the future. So I, I, I just want to challenge us again to be reminded. A little bit of prompting this week. A lot of stuff eating up in the Middle East. You know, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But we leave a legacy. We leave to our 
family, our kids, our grandkids? Do we, what instructions have we given them? Now maybe, you know, arrangements and what funeral home we're going to use that. That's fine, that's good, that's probably helpful. Very necessary to do that, helps them out. But what about, hey, there's a future, there's a future. Christ is going to come back and he's going to back with great power and glory. You better be ready. And if he doesn't come back in your lifetime, pass it on to the next generation. And pass it on to the next generation. And pass it on to the next generation. This future perspective. Christ's going to return. He's going to give rewards. And it will be worth serving. He's going to bring judgment. He's also going to bring justice. And needs to, a lot of justice needs to be done in this world, right? Setting things right. He's going to bring a whole new heaven and earth. Everything is going to be brand spanking new. Isn't that something? And your life, your body, your being, all things become new in a new heaven and new earth. So what are we leaving behind? And what instructions have we given? Maybe about your bones, but more importantly, what are you leading them to? If you don't want to stay in Egypt, you want to be brought back to the promised land. I don't know how we understood that and knew it, but it was significant in the scripture and courage as they went a long way. So as uh, the other day, I went on a killing spree. <coughs> I did. I killed them all. Bees, that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so earlier this summer, I'm out weeding in the back here and you guys are out filling the cracks as you're going and, and you see me jumping and running around and hollering and screaming i got bit by three or four bees that were in the ground back here on the outside where those lilies are uh, and i lost my glasses sunglasses i eventually found them there but i kind of left and walked away well I, I figured I've been doing a little bit of weeding, getting things ready for the fall. I said, there, I, I, there is a hole in the ground back here where there were just dozens and dozens of bees going into. And I'm not going anywhere near that to trim those, that stuff. So I got the spray, the foam at 15, 20 yards. And, and if, well, the rain washed them away. There were Dozens and dozens and dozens. I think they were yellow jack. They were this big, those suckers. They were dead all over the back of them. The park. They stand out with a new parking lot, you know, the yellow. <laughs> now that the wind and what in the rain has washed them away, but I killed them. So now I can go weep or whatever. Well, all that to say, not only is that just kind of an interesting uh, turn of events in, in life, but you know what? There are. I think the enemy in life, the bees, just sometimes slowly get in and, 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 and hinder. Maybe they sting. Maybe they keep us from doing whatever. But there's sometimes, even if our faith, literally or figurative, working through this, that we, we could, those things are hindering us from doing what we could and should do for the Lord Jesus Christ. If it was sometimes as simple as getting bug bee spray and killing them, and going back the second time, it'd be like, it'd be nice if life was that easy, but it's not. And some of those bees or whatever critters are bothering us in our faith and our soul, they can get burrow in pretty deeply. But I hope that as we looked at this whole thing about the, the patriarchs, what a motley crew, huh? Can you identify with them in some ways? They weren't the saints come marching in as we would want to think, and yet God used them. So they were messed up, they were sinful, they were doubters, they were misfits, they were schemers, they were dreamers, they were older, yada, yada, yada. And God still, and, and even they, as he, Hebrew says, they still speak today. So you and I have the privilege of speaking to generations beyond if the Lord would keep us here and not return. And here's the thought that came to mind. Just like these patriarchs, they may or may not have known. I mean, if, if they only knew how many, 2,000 years later, we'd be talking about it and using their name and their lives as an example, huh? Well, when you think about the kingdom of God, you and I 
are the hands and feet of Jesus. That in this dark world full of wars, Middle East, Ukraine, whatever, floods, all these sickness, pain, and stuff, all this stuff is frustrating if people are scared, they're hurting, it's painful, it's frustrating, yada, yada, yada. We come in with grace and mercy and love and show them that God loves them. And they have a plan and a pr we're salt to the healing. We are light to give direction and hope in darkness. So that's part of our future perspective. Is that life's here, there's tomorrow, who knows what the challenges will be? Who knows what the challenges have been in the past? It's always been faithful. There's gonna be few. But this it's it's way beyond us. Joseph saw the future. Hey, take my bones there. Because I'm not sticking around in the hole here in Egypt. And I hope that we keep that in mind as we pass the baton to generations and to recognize that God is at work and he's got plans and purposes as he works into the future. So I, again, I listened to, uh, I forget exactly who this one was too, but I like this as I, I shared with the, the ladies uh, last time at Ambrose Ridge. If you're not dead, you're not done. Write that down. Say it with me. If you're not dead, you're not done. Profound, really. You may be limited by physical ability. You may be limited financially. You may be limited whatever it is that, you know, when you were a young whippersnapper. But if you're not in the ground, you still have viability to be used in the kingdom. And hopefully even more so as the years gone by from the experiences that you've learned and how you can come alongside and help others. So I hope that as we conclude the patriarchs as a whole, this, this, what a crew, be reminded and then also encouraged with this perspective in heaven. We, we just gotta keep, keep our hand on the plow, keep serving away, <coughs> if you're not dead, you're not, do it one again, once again with me. If you're not, yeah, Lord, it's easy just to sit and sometimes maybe not do something, or we never admit that we're pouting, but we also you know can be frustrated, and and we our faith at times uh, is limited, and yet we ask Lord that you would grant to us a renewed encouragement of faith because you're walking with us. You're in our lives whether we feel it, whether we know it or sense it or whatever. You, your love for us is steadfast and nothing will separate us from your love. And with that, Father, we want to be diligent and with a future perspective of, of uh, beyond my life. It's the, you, the kingdom is going beyond and we'll be part of it and we're passing that along and picking up the other generations. May we be diligent in that, Father. Even as we as a church enter in next week in a day of prayer, a week of prayer, may that even be an instigator of our own hearts and lives, just to listen, to hear, to be encouraged and blessed and renewed in our relationship with you. So, Father, we want to be faithful. In Jesus' name. The scripture, if you would, guide me, O thou great Jehovah, 359, please. In, in your hymnal, 359. I was looking through them. That's an old classic, isn't it? Stand with me, please. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrims through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Isn't that a great passage? <laughs>
close today, I'm going to read from the scriptures, the closing benediction and prayer. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you and blessings.